Hello, and welcome to our first instructional video on how to plan UAS flight operations. This series of videos is brought to you by AmericaView in partnership with the College of Natural Resources and Environment at Virginia Tech, the Virginia Cooperative Extension, and GeoTED UAS. My name is Daniel Cross, and I'll be your guide for this series of videos. To start with, I cannot overly stress the importance of safety when it comes to being a UAS pilot, commercial or hobbyist. Safety must be in the forefront of our minds and actions during all stages of a UAS operation, starting with flight planning. Our goal in this series of videos is to prepare you to be a safe and responsible UAS operator. While we'll focus on the skills and requirements for commercial flights under PERT 107, these are also good practices for hobbyists. Each video in this series will cover a different topic, more or less in the order that I perform them as part of my workflow. In the rest of this series, we'll discuss how to perform digital scouting, how to make a basic automated flight plan for a fixed wing UAS, how to make a basic automated flight plan for a rotary wing UAS, advanced automated flight plans focusing on 3D mapping and capturing video, a basic pre-flight weather briefing, and an advanced pre-flight weather briefing. In this video, we'll discuss flight planning solutions as well as concepts that we'll explore in the following videos. While our examples will focus on using automated UAS flight plans to create mapping data, the concepts that you will learn are applicable to all small UAS operations. The first concept I would like to introduce is that of situational awareness. Maintaining a proper level of situational awareness starts in the office, or home as the case may be, when we do what I call digital scouting, or reconnaissance if you prefer, of an intended worksite. As UAS pilots, we need to be aware of all possible hazards to our flight, as well as anything that we might pose a risk to, so that we can start mitigating those risks before we even set foot outside. These risks could be other aircraft, people or vehicles on the ground, obstacles such as trees and buildings, or even just the general terrain, airspace restrictions, or weather conditions. By using tools such as VFR sectional charts, Google Earth, and flight services, we can start to become aware of many of these potential issues as early as possible, allowing us to start thinking of ways to avoid those risks. We will also need to get a pre-flight briefing, which is an important part of our situational awareness. We'll want to check notices to airmen, or NOTAMs, and the weather forecast as close to the time of flight as possible to make sure we have the most up-to-date information. NOTAMs will give us any timely information that we need to know that isn't found on a chart directory, in the regulations, or on any other normal source of information. Some NOTAMs may even prevent us from flying at all, either by warning us of unsafe conditions or because they're notifying us of temporary flight restrictions, also known as TFRs. After we've checked the NOTAMs, we need to check the weather. Aside from the pilot and the UAV itself, weather will have the largest impact on safety and performance of our flight. There are several aspects of weather that we need to be concerned about. The most basic is that under Part 107, we have to have visual flight rule or VFR conditions to fly. VFR conditions are a minimum of three statute miles visibility while remaining clear of clouds by at least 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally, and 500 feet below. The most important aspect of weather is probably wind. Our UAVs will be rated by the manufacturer to fly in a maximum wind speed. However, I found that these are often on the optimistic side. Just because a UAV can fly doesn't mean that it can take decent pictures or video. As an example, while all of the UAVs that I work with are rated to fly in winds up to 28 miles per hour, I found that after about 15 or 16 miles per hour, data collection becomes difficult, although that can depend on how consistent the winds are. In my experience, a higher speed wind that is very consistent is better to fly a small UAV in than a low speed wind that is constantly changing speed and direction. We also need to consider that wind will change how the UAV flies, which can change the overlap of our images and will increase the energy demand on the battery, shortening our maximum flight time. 
Many UAV accidents are due to wind either directly causing the aircraft to crash or causing the battery to be used faster than expected. Now, let's talk about flight planning. To start with, there are lots of different flight planning software solutions available. Often, the flight planning software that you use will be dictated by the UAV that you have, which is often dictated by the type of sensor that you want to fly. Some flight planners will work with many different UAVs, such as Mission Planner, which will work with any autonomous vehicle that has a PixHawk autopilot. Others, however, will only work with a very limited set of UAVs. If you have yet to buy a UAS, it's important to start by figuring out what sensor you need to fly, then determine the best UAV to mount that to, then find what mission planning software is compatible with that UAV and sensor. You'll want to do this before making any purchase, and one easy route is to buy a packaged system designed to meet your needs. If you already have a UAS that you want to use, you may find that your software options are a bit limited. It's also worth noting that different flight planning suites offer different capabilities, ease of use, as well as various degrees of what's best described as idiot proofing. Often, the more customizable a flight planner is, the easier it is to get in trouble. Some flight planners will warn you if the flight plan intersects with an elevation model, whereas others are happy enough to follow your instructions right into the side of a mountain. Now, when we're creating flight plans for mapping missions, there are a number of variables to consider. When we're using a UAS for surveying or mapping, we're normally taking a large number of individual still images that are then fed into some sort of post-processing software to generate a georeferenced mosaic. This means that we're taking all of those images and stitching them together to make a single image that has a spatial coordinate system so it can be used for mapping, very much like the imagery used in Google Earth. To make a good mosaic, we need to ensure that the individual images are overlapping. This is so the post-processing software can find what are called key points in all of the images to line them up for stitching. Now, how we want the images to overlap is determined by the sensor, type of UAV, and what we're trying to map. As a general rule, for mapping areas with a fairly variable terrain texture, a fixed-wing UAS should aim for about a 75% side-to-side and a 65% front-to-back overlap, whereas a rotary-wing UAS would want the inverse, a 65% side-to-side overlap and a 75% front-to-back overlap. However, if I was flying an area with a very little texture, such as a large wheat field, or an area with a very complex texture, such as a dense forest, I may need to increase that overlap. This is due to how the post-processing software works. With very low texture environments, the processing software has trouble finding key points that it can identify in multiple images, or it finds false key points that are in fact not the same point because everything kind of looks the same. High texture environments pose a slightly different set of problems. With forest, there are so many potential key points, processing software has trouble telling the difference between a good key point and noise such as key points found on branches swaying in the wind. Also, a lot of those key points are only found in one image, like a point on the ground that can only be seen through a hole in the canopy in a single image. Ideally, we would like to have an 85% front-to-back overlap and side-to-side overlap when mapping something like a forest. By increasing the overlap, this increases the potential to find more and better key points. However, it also takes much longer to fly the same area, which can mean multiple flights increasing both time and cost of a mapping mission. If the overlap is not high enough, we'll end up with a final product that is of subpar quality, or perhaps even data that's so poor that you'll have to refly the mission completely, and this can be a costly mistake. With experience, you will come to understand your UAS and sensors well enough to be able to determine what overlap is required to generate a map of acceptable quality, but also one that doesn't waste too much time flying for longer than is necessary. Another aspect of our front-to-back overlap to keep in mind is that cameras can only trigger so fast, normally about every one to three seconds. Because fixed-wing UAVs have to maintain a minimum airspeed to stay airborne, they normally have a higher side-to-side overlap. 
This is not an issue for rotary wing UAVs since they can simply slow down or even hover to take pictures. As an example, with low resolution thermal imagery, it's advised to have a 90% front to back and side to side overlap. The fixed wing UAV I normally work with could never achieve that high of a front to back overlap since it would be required to either trigger the camera about four times a second or the UAV would have to fly so slow that it wouldn't be able to stay aloft. So in this example, I would need to use a rotary wing UAV that can achieve my desired overlap. Because of the speed limitation, generally speaking, fixed wing UAVs need to have a higher side to side overlap and rotary wing UAVs tend to prefer a higher front to back overlap. Related to overlap is the speed which our UAV flies. As we just discussed, speed can affect the front to back overlap but it can also affect how the sensor captures data. If your UAV is flying too fast, the images from digital cameras can be blurry. The closer the camera is to the subject, the stronger this effect will be. So while you can capture imagery just fine at 25 miles an hour when the UAV is 350 feet up, you'll need to slow way down when you're flying only 20 feet above your target. This is then complicated by the camera or sensor that you're using. More expensive sensors will have global shutters, which means that the entire sensor is exposed to light at the same time, capturing the entire image all at once. This type of shutter is preferable as it reduces the effect of motion. The sensors that are commonly found on hobby UAVs and cameras such as GoPros often have rolling shutters. With rolling shutters, the camera view is quickly scanned, with only small portions of the sensor collecting data at any given instant. When the camera is moving quickly, or taking pictures of rapidly moving objects, it can distort the image. With video, this can cause a vibrating jello effect, and can cause still images to appear S-shaped or slanted, neither of which is particularly desirable. This is due to the object in the camera's view being in a different position as each group of sensor pixels is exposed. Here is an image of a spinning airplane propeller looking a little odd. This is due to the camera sensor being exposed in a side-to-side -side manner. And in each group of pixels, the propeller was in a slightly different location. When the UAV is moving too fast, a camera with rolling shutter will capture images with similar distortion, which will ruin a map and make video look pretty bad. Now, let's talk about resolution, also often called ground sampling distance. The cameras that are used on small UAS for mapping are often not able to zoom in and out. So we control the resolution of the individual images by changing the altitude of the aircraft. The lower the aircraft flies, the higher the resolution, and the higher the aircraft is, the lower the resolution. But altitude also affects overlap. The lower the UAV, the smaller the footprint of each image. The higher the altitude, the larger the footprint. This means that by flying higher, we can cover a larger area with a single image. So to be as efficient as possible, we want to fly as high as we safely can while still getting a mapping resolution that meets our mission requirements. Now normally this is not much of an issue. Under the regulations that govern UAS operations in the United States, we can only fly up to 400 feet above ground level, or AGL. At this altitude, most of our sensors will be getting resolutions or ground sampling distances of about 1 to 8 inches per pixel. In the realm of remote sensing, this is pretty much considered ultra-high resolution. So we will normally want to fly as high as safety regulations, our equipment, and terrain will allow us. To end this video, I'd like to bring us back around to the first point of this video, and that's all of the flight planning that we'll be covering in this series is designed to help us prepare for operations in the field by building safety into every step of the process. This way we can reduce any risks involved with the flight and we'll be prepared to adapt when things don't go the way we expected. In our next video, we'll cover the first step for flight planning, which is pre-flight scouting using Google Earth and GIS. Fly safe.